Welcome back to One on One, New York's longest running sports call in show. Andrew Posada is here alongside Chris Hennessy. And it is my pleasure to welcome our next guest, a former Major League Baseball umpire, spent over three decades calling games, now retired, has a great auction going, The Magic of Baseball from collectibleexchange.com, alongside former Mets manager Bobby Valentine, welcoming to the show John Hirschbeck. John, Appreciate the time here on one on one. Thanks, Andrew. It's nice to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah. And first of all, I just like to send out our regards. Hope that your family is well and safe amid the current pandemic. Obviously, 2020 ha has been tough on everybody. But for yourself now, having been retired since 2016, how, how have you been taking the last four years just into this new chapter of your life? I've been enjoying the heck out of it. I really have. Um, Kind of a true test for us is you, you can know like, okay, what's your winners like? Are you busy? You know, and I, I always was, always had something to do, a lot of hobbies. And so the last four years since retirement, I tell my friends, other than having our children, it's God's greatest gift because I'm having a ball. Speaking of, you know, the pandemic, obviously a, a very unique baseball season and postseason this year. What have you thought of the 60 games and the 16 teams have you been watching? Uh, and now we're a couple days away from uh, crowning a champion here. Well, I give Major League Baseball a lot of credit. I never thought, probably like a lot of people, that they would be able to pull it off. Um, but they have. And um, some semblance of a season, which is pretty good, I think. And, um, you know, kudos to them. I think it's great that uh, it's, it's happened for people because everyone was so hungry for baseball. It's like something in everyone's life that without it, something's, you know, really missing. So... It's been a good thing, great thing. And, John, w when you think about baseball and a lot of people want the game to be faster and they want it to progress so that it reaches out to more demographics and you've seen some of these new rules implemented with a runner on second base going into extra innings, what, what do you think about the state of baseball right now as it stands? Well, that's a tough question. I don't agree with a lot of things because I'm probably more old fashioned. I came to the big leagues in the eighties. I went to umpiring school and minor leagues in the seventies. Um, I, I think if somebody's going to watch nine innings of baseball, it's anticlimactic to put a runner on second base and say, let's finish the game this way. Um, you know, if you're going to spend three plus hours watching may as well finish it to the end and finish it the way we've always known it. It changes everything. I mean, it really does. It, it certainly does. And, and you worked in both the American and the National League uh, throughout your career. And something that we saw this year as well was the addition of the designated hitter in the National League. What are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you like it separate? Do you like them together? Uh, as somebody who literally uh, right in front of their eyes saw them both, uh, uh, curious your thoughts on that. I was always personally an anti-DH person. Um, you know, when I, when I was able, my first 17 years in the American League, uh, my second 17 where we did both, and I just think there's so much more to the game being kind of old-fashioned. I'll keep saying that, but, you know, we're, there's so much more managing that has to go on. There's so much more on the field. Players have to execute bunting and, and things like that, getting runners over. Um, the, to me, there's just a lot more to the game itself mm. without the DH. Here talking with former MLB umpire John Hirschbeck. And John, you, you have said that you're old-fashioned, and I, I see this, and I think we see this throughout certain games where people will bring up the concept of having robot umpires because of the fact that human error and, and having and making sure that every call, every pitch is called correctly. To that, you say what? Wow. <laughs> it literally, Wow. Um, it's just the game has just, they're, they're changing it so much. I can remember when it first started with, uh, calls replay on fair foul balls in the stands, things like just started a little bit. And I said, look out fellas, because once this starts, the, the doors open, it's good. They're going to, everyone society is that way now that they're going to want more and more and more. And where we had replay and I, I had my last three years of my career had all the replay um, and now with the idea of an automated strike zone, um, I, I just don't see the game being helped out by doing that. We, 
if society has gotten that far along that we want everything to be so perfect, um, do I want to see a game ended on a play where an umpire misses it? No, it's our worst nightmare. So to be able to correct things like that, um, and I use this example. Let's say it's April and it's 15 nothing. My team is ahead, okay? And John Hirschbeck comes up to bat, and I, I had it, hidden a ball in the infield, and it's a bang-bang play at first base. And I go to my manager like, okay, I was called out. I want to be safe. And the manager goes and looks at it. Well, what does that, that – that's because of me selfishly wanting a hit in April in a 15 nothing game. I just don't see that. I really don't. But that's me. Very interesting. Um, you've been uh, part of some – fantastic historic games including one of the best games I mean I'll speak personally I've ever seen game seven your last ever game game seven of the 2016 World Series uh out in Cleveland talk about talk to us about that game the breaking of the 108 year streak the Rajay Davis home run just an absolutely crazy game um that that was your last game ever I I was excited because people always say well in the game of baseball professionally my two greatest times ever was my first world series because obviously your goal in the minors is to get to the major leagues once you do that your next goal is okay I want to work a world series I want that ring on my hand and know that I I was good enough and chosen to do it you get so a my, ring when you work a world series yeah yeah wow I didn't know that That's beautiful awesome. rings yes they're really really nice they're not big and gaudy I would <laughs> say like the players are or like you've seen the NFL rings right but they're um they're just big enough to have a little bit of bling, but they're, they are beautiful. That's awesome. Um, so that was Cleveland, which is near us here, and, um, and Atlanta, and a great honor. Then my, and then obviously then my fifth and last World Series just happened to work out where it could have been two greater cities, Chicago and Cleveland again. And Terry Francona has always been a dear friend of our families, and my son Michael just loved them, and um, you know they were very, very close. So... It couldn't have been better. It really couldn't have. And I'll tell you one inside thing. Everybody, Cleveland people will say, well, Hirschbeck stopped the game for 17 minutes for that rain delay, if you remember. the infamous yes, rain I, delay. I remember for sure. Yeah. But um, the thing is, nowadays, if you didn't have the technology, again, here I am talking about being old-fashioned more in the game, but the technology is what helped me knowing that it was going to come. When it started, it was going to be really hard. So I was able to send word to both managers and say, listen, don't think I'm nuts. When the drops start, I'm pulling them off the field right away. It's going to be a hard burst. We can get them off and get them back on. Because I also knew that in Toledo, the next front was coming through. So we had about 45 minutes after the rain delay to finish the game. And if we didn't finish, it rained all night into early the next morning. Mm -hmm. So we would have had to come back the next day. So... It, it worked out very, very well. Um, somebody had to win. But I, the last thing I wanted to see happen was, you know, a shortstop goes in the hole and he slips and the World Series gets won on conditions of the field instead of the merit of the team. John, few people understand what goes on in the mind of a Major League Baseball umpire. But luckily for you, your brother, Mark, was also yeah. an umpire and you guys were together for, I believe, a 15-year period from 88 to 2003. Can you just talk about having a – I mean, most people are umpires, and, and that's it. They're the only one in their families that, that's a major yep. league baseball umpire. How was it having you and your brother both working in the league? Well, first, we were the first ones, and then right after us, Bill Welke and Tim Welke, who basically came up when I did. Um, and Tim retired when I did, and Bill's still working. So, but um, it, it was a great honor. I was very proud of him because, you know – whether or not they say Hirschbeck, and I, I said this to Mark at the time, he was just in umpire school. I said, you're still going to have to do it on your own. I can't be there to call balls and strikes, safes and outs. You have to be able to perform at that level yourself. So I was very proud of him. I'm the oldest in the family. He's the youngest. And um, unfortunately had a, a, a hip injury that, that ended his career. But um, he's still doing great. I talk to him about every day. He's in Connecticut and I'm out here in Ohio. But um, it was a, it was great for the family. My dad just died last, last year at 92. And, you know, he was in his glory between being able to go to games and they were in Florida in spring and he would go with Michael and I to every game. So it's been a, a great family thing. 
Baseball has been our lives, really has been my life. I, I thank God every day because everything I have in life is because of baseball. Can you uh, talk about it? It's the experience that only a few people have being the home plate umpire during a no hitter? Just how much pressure? I guess the no hitter is a little bit different than a perfect game, but how much pressure is that? when you're sitting there in the eighth and ninth inning, knowing that this guy is about to make history, especially the one that you called Roy Halladay yeah. uh, in the playoffs. Um, just, just what are you thinking after 20, after 18, 21 outs? Uh, like, wow, this is, this is really about to happen. Well, first of all, the difference between a perfect game and a no hitter is not really in your mind because somebody walked earlier and mm -hmm. it, it wasn't really didn't have anything to do with me. It was just, he walked someone. Right. Um, but then you go by that and, and you're really just thinking, I looked up after four innings cause I thought, boy, he's got good stuff tonight. And I happened to look up at the scoreboard, looked at the crowd. Oh, they got a big crowd tonight. Cause you, you're so into the game. You don't notice it until later when you're kind of relaxing between innings. But I said, Oh, wow. Um, Cincinnati doesn't have any hits yet. And, um, then the fifth inning goes by and same thing. So at that point, I did say to myself, okay, just keep doing what you're doing. You're seeing the ball well. Take your time. Don't get caught up in the crowd. I always tell young umpires, when the volume goes up in the stadium, you have to take your internal volume and turn it down. As they go up, you have to come down and make yourself be more calm, more relaxed, more, totally in control. And um, just went inning by inning and, and whether, no matter which team it was for, I just said, okay, lock in, stay the way you are and keep working hard. Don't let this game be on me. Mm -hmm. Pleased to be joined by former MLB umpire, John Hirschbeck. And John, I, I want to get this right because I'm looking here and it says that you began umpiring as a senior in high school because yeah. you were short of money to attend your prom. So you started umpiring little league games for $5 every game. Can you just talk about how sure. you got started and how that came about? That was back in 1972. So the $5 <laughs> wasn't that bad back then. Um, yeah, I was a senior and um, wanted to go to the prom. I thought, well, if I get a job, I can make some money. And a, and a guy in town, a small town in Connecticut, Stratford, and um, a, guy, a man that I knew said, well, listen, we need umpires. And I was never any good at baseball. I think I stopped playing when I was 12 years old after Little League. And um, I'm like, all right, I'll try it. And then a week later, he called and said, well, we need an umpire in chief. I go, what's that mean? And he said, well, we need someone to schedule all the Little League games for the town. I said, well, if, if, I take, if I'm in charge of that, can I schedule myself as much as I want? And he said, yeah. So I was making, you know, $35 a week plus maybe double headers on the weekend. But I enjoyed it. It's like just something where God put in my life that I, I said, this is really a lot of fun. So next year in college, I took tests to join the local association and started doing high school ball. And I always say that people, as corny as it sounds, by my sophomore, junior year, I'm, I'm watching TV and kind of started watching umpires uh, on games. There weren't that many on TV back then. But um, I just really thought like, okay, how do they ever get to do it at that level? Someone's got to do that for a living. And I found out about umpire school. So in the middle of my senior year of college, I went down. Uh, to Florida, Daytona. It was called Al Summers Umpiring School back then. And um, I finished second in my class out of 149 guys. And so I went back, dropped out of college um, for my last half semester. And I worked in the Florida State League that year and then went back in the fall and finished up college. And the rest, then I was on to the minor leagues. A couple of Connecticut, Connecticut guys making it to the major leagues. I love it. Yeah. Um, what... I mean, I'm sure it's a question you ask, uh, answer every day, but what's the one game where you sit in retirement and you think that that was my favorite game I was ever, I ever worked, I was ever at, regardless of what base you were working that night? The most amazing game, and I thought this in the um, League Division Series, when the Cubs were playing the Giants, game four, and we all assumed, like, I was at first base that night, between innings, second base umpire, right field umpire, and I were like meeting in the outfield saying, and I'm telling them, okay, you take care of the limo, make sure we got rooms, um, you know, the plans, because it just looked like there, we were definitely going uh, back. San Francisco was ahead. We were going back to Chicago for game five and the Cubs came back and won that game 
to go on to the next to the division series uh, to the LCS. And that game was absolutely amazing. The, the just them, the Cubs coming back and how it happens. And I thought that until I got to the World Series and then game seven, I would say, was even more amazing. Just it was those were two of the greatest games I, I've you know, there were there were a lot in my career. But mm-hmm. those were two that were just like, wow, this is OK. I need to go home and take a break. <laughs> John, I want to get into your auction now, the magic of baseball, <clears throat> excuse me, with collectibleexchange.com. Obviously, between you and former Mets manager Bobby Valentine, and obviously this is to benefit your The Magic of Michael Foundation dedicated to your late son, Michael, and for Bobby Valentine to support the Jackie Robinson Foundation Scholarship of Sacred Heart University. So, John, just can you tell us what ultimately prompted you to collaborate with Bobby to start this auction? Obviously, over 500 memorabilia pieces, a, a lot to auction off here. So can you just talk to us more about this auction sure. and what ultimately prompted you to do so? Sure. Um, being in Yankee Stadium, as many times as I have in my life, I always saw Steiner auctions, you know, Brandon Steiner. And um, I figured, like, this, I knew the, it was a big place. I figured New York, he's a success. So when this all started, I called him. He decided to put these two together. So Bobby's is for Sacred Heart University. And I've happened over the years to know Bobby very well. Um, But mine is for separately. So it's called the Magic of Baseball. Um, All the proceeds from our memorabilia go to the Magic of Michael. Um, And we started that when Michael passed away in uh, April of 14. A couple of months later, friends of his came to us and they said, we want to do something to keep Michael's memory alive. We'd like to have a golf tournament. And from that, we had a golf tournament with a dinner. Joe Torrey was one of our first guests. Jim Leland has been there another year. Uh, two years ago, we had Terry Francona and Jim Tome. Um, and it's always been like, okay, how can we raise more money? So about a year and a half ago, th- these things were so dear to Michael all the memorabilia, you know, he got a lot of things. I had tons. Um, I told my wife, I said, you know, this stuff isn't doing any good. My friends don't come over here to look at that stuff or, you know, um, but we could do a lot of good with it if we auctioned it off. And um, so the idea came about very good friend of mine that I fish with a lot. Mike, uh, Mike McCoy from mentor Ohio used to come down spend the night and, um, he was really into it. So he, he did a lot of the work for me. It was like, oh God, he's coming again, you know, to, to stay with us and we're going to have to work. But little by little, it came together. We categorized everything. Um, Brandon sent a van from New York City and they came, they picked everything up and um, away it went. So 100% of the proceeds that are raised from this go to the Magical Michael. Can I talk about that a little bit now or do you want to? Absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. Go right ahead. Okay. So... The Magic of Michael, our um, motto, our theme, our mission statement is uh, helping families endure the curveballs of life. And um, we have done everything. We work with Akron Children's Hospital. We've given them, since Michael passed away, a a quarter of a million dollars. And we also help families that inner city, underprivileged children. We have different programs, after school programs where kids can go and have food, play, do homework, um, things like that. And then mostly the monies go to helping families with children with disabilities. Um, We have done everything from build wheelchair ramps to um, electric wheelchairs. We had companion dogs for some children. We remodeled bathrooms, pay to have bathrooms remodeled, handicapped version, Um, and just, on and on and on. We have a Christmas program for kids in the hospital that are terminally ill, um, Santa Claus, and buy gifts for the entire family. We have another program called Go Baby Go, which a vocational school, we buy the cars and the vocational school individual for each child under, they've never walked. They're, they're three, four years old. They've never even, they've never walked. And each car is customized for that child's disabilities. And if they even can't work the steering wheel, they remote control it where the parents can take the car out in the driveway and drive the, you know, the kids move around. 
So a lot of different programs. We're very involved in the community. Like I said, we work hand in hand with Akron Children's Hospital and um, no one on the Magical Michael gets paid. Our daughter, Erin, is the president of it. Uh, she lives here in this area and um, you know, all the money goes to the kids. That's amazing stuff. Uh, where, where can people help out, get information uh, about the events and the auction and, and all of that? I'm glad you asked. All they have to do is go to magicofmichael.com. There's actually a link to get onto the auction. Um, what I would really encourage people to do that are watching this or hear this is go to the magicofmichael.com. You'll see pictures. You'll see articles uh, down at the bottom. If it says uh, related articles, there's one story by Lisa Pollock who won the Pulitzer Prize. It's called The Umpire Sons. You'll learn a lot more about the disease, about our family, things that have gone on um, throughout my career since John passed in 93. And um, it, it will be very informative. I think once they see it, the, they'll, they'll go, wow, these people are doing a lot of good. And I think we are. Yeah, I'm on this website right now. There's some amazing pictures, some great auction items. So uh, definitely go check it out. Yep. And again, that is the magic of baseball auction. You can check it out, collectibleexchange.com, over 500 memorabilia pieces. And obviously, as John mentioned, to benefit the Magic of Michael Foundation and the auction block runs through November 14th. But John, we really appreciate you taking the time here to join us on one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure and honor to be on the show with you. And um, thanks for helping me to get the word out about this.